Hello, my name is uh, Captain Wynn from Clayton County Fire and Emergency Services. I actually work in the emergency management department. Um, our department mainly deals with disasters such as flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, and things like that. Um, well, in my, my experiences, um, I've worked with the county for over 15 years. Um, eight of those years, I worked for the Clayton County Police Department. I did, you know, mainly um, undercover narcotics work and things like that and um, progressed forward, got my master's in Homeland Security uh, in emergency management. And so I went to the fire department. I'm a firefighter and now I work in emergency management as a captain. So a little bit about what we're going to do today is we're going to learn a little bit about preparedness. Um, kind of preparedness is one of those things. It's it's There's such a vast, um, I guess, things that you can do to prepare. I mean, there's so many things, but we're, I'm just going to narrow down on some things such as weather and um, just what you need to do uh, in cases of, you know, you may have to... Um, take your family somewhere during an emergency, what you need to do, how much water you should have and things like that. Um, so this is a little bit of uh, some images that we've had um, actual flooding locations in Clayton County. Um, she actually works with us. Her, her name is Cody Loman. She used to work with us. And uh, this was a tree that fell in somebody's house. So you can see that disasters happen all the time in Clayton County. We may not see it as much as we think we see it, but it happens. So um, we're going to identify the roles and responsibility for community preparedness. Today, we're going to describe the types of different hazards that can affect the community, um, health and infrastructure, discover ways to prepare for disaster and describes functions of preparedness. Um, that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. Um, when you ask what is Clayton County Emergency Management, I, I did really didn't get into it, um, but Clayton County Emergency Management is basically, we deal with um, the greater things that happen in Clayton County, such as disasters. Um, and we help people with uh, setting up, um, for example, a emergency action plan for the department. I believe we set up one for the library and a few other places. So. That's what uh, that's what emergency management does. So we develop, test, and refine emergency plans. So that's a little bit about the emergency action plan. We ensure emergency responders have adequate skills and resources. We actually get a lot of grants from the, the state to um, for resources, such as vehicles to drones to pretty much anything. I'm actually working on a drone policy right now to get drones for the metro Atlanta area. And we provide services um, to protect and assist citizens. Uh, we coordinate with the American Red Cross and other agencies to uh, help with people with funding and things like that. So when it comes to disasters, we have three types of disasters that uh, we normally teach people. There's, this is actually a class that um, I've taken out of from CERT, which is the Community Emergency Response Team. Um, I've just taken some ideas from them, but the Community Emergency Response Team is a uh, well-recognized um, team within the United States that started in 1986, and um, it deals with disasters. But the three types of disasters are going to be natural, technological, and intentional. So um, those are the three types. So what really separates uh, technological and intentional is the intent behind it. So Let's, let's think about some natural um, disasters. Natural disasters are like flooding. Um, you have forest fires, tornadoes, things like that. That would be a natural disaster. Technological disasters are, as you can see, things like airplane falling out of the sky. Um, you have oil rigs that are on fire, boats that are on fire, um, you know, things like power plants that are on fire. And then if, if you guys remember when 285, um, when it was on fire and it collapsed and we ended up closing, that would be technological, okay? Because it wasn't, there wasn't intent by it. When I talk about inter, uh, intentional or like terrorism, things like that, somebody did it on purpose. So you have 9-11, you have um, the Paris bombings and things like that. That's intentional. Somebody did it on purpose. And um, that's that's where the disasters are. All right, so 
some of the elements with uh, disasters is that they're relatively unexpected. We don't know when they're going to happen. Uh, if we did, we would be um, obviously there to help people out, but they're always unexpected. And uh, and emergency personnel can, may be overwhelmed. Oftentimes with this class, when I teach this class, um, I have an audience and I can ask questions, but usually a lot of people don't realize this. We only have about 14 ambulances in Clayton County. So if you know, six or seven people are hurt and we have to transport uh, six or seven people out of one location. They're only, there's only about six or seven ambulances that are left to be utilized. So that's where issues come in uh, with, with personnel becoming overwhelmed. Um, so um, let me see. Also about things about um, key disaster elements is that uh, lives, health, and the environment are in danger. So oftentimes when we go to the location, you know, we may need help as well. Just not the, the um, like, for example, if there's a snowstorm and things like that, and I have to leave my house um, to go and help the community, my, my wife is left at home basically by herself. So you can kind of see where it adds a lot of elements to the disaster. So what can you do to prepare your house at your home? Um, you know, if this was a live class, I would give out um, first aid kits and things like that. But uh, how can you protect your home? You need to have a, a, a bug out kit, basically a kit where if you have to leave or survive and things like that in your house, um, we ask you to store it somewhere. For example, there needs to be water, food, medication, and things like that. So know all the local hazards in your area. Uh, when you're preparing for disasters like it, you know, we, we're not going to probably prepare for an earthquake in Georgia because that's something that doesn't really happen that much. Uh, understand the alerts and warning systems, understand all the evacuation routes, uh, know your roads, you know, don't just rely on GPS all the time. A lot of people, they don't know all the roads in their community to escape because you know, they travel only one way all the time. They don't try to travel outside that road or anything. And whenever a disaster happens, everybody's going to be on the main road. So you could be stuck in traffic and not realize it. Uh, have a sheltering plan. Know where your family can meet if something really bad happens and things like that. Consider important elements of a disaster preparedness. Know that, you know, there's certain things that you're going to need in, in, in certain disasters. Um and you know your family, if you're going to prepare for a disaster kit, you know, you know, like you may have older like parents that are living with you in your house and things like that. And you may need uh, to bring medication with you and things like that. We also have this Ready Clayton app that I'm, I could go into, but I, don't, I think I'm going to stay out of that app right now because uh, I think it might be just too much um, to try to describe on um, this Zoom meet. All right, so when we will actually send out weather outlooks in Clayton County. You may get that uh, in your email. Uh, it's usually issues three to seven days before the event. And a lot of times we have a very low certainty that the outlook is going to be exactly what they tell us through the National Weather Service. Sometimes, you know, it's we know that rain is going to happen or snow will happen, but we don't know exactly where it's going to be. And many times it's, it's the National Weather Service will even tell you that they don't, they're not even guaranteed that they, uh, that whatever they're sending is a hundred percent. So there's, um, there's these sayings that we usually send out to people and that's kind of important for you to know, for example, shelter in place. Shelter in place is basically, you know, um, if, for example, let's just say there's a hazmat spill and we're like, hey, shelter in place. That means that stay where you're at. Don't go. Don't um, try to leave the house. Uh, turn off your AC and things like that, meaning that you're, you're staying in your internal room. Stay there for several hours and make sure that your supplies are in that room. But that's basically what shelter in place is, that you're not being evacuated or you're not being forced to leave. You're you're told to stay there. Then shelter for extended stay, stay for several days um, in your location and store, have like a pretty robust um, emergency kit. Um, 
And then we have mass care locations uh, in the community. If something, for example, an apartment fire were to happen, we can actually have some recreation centers that you can go and stay at for, for several days. Um, but yeah, and we'll give you disaster kits and things like that at those locations. And that's only happens whenever something really, really bad happens, right? Um, what should you have in your um, shelter? Obviously food um, for you to eat for those days. Um, water, at least one gallon of water per day per person. So if you have five people in your house and you're staying there for one day, you're going to need five gallons of water. Um, and um, the thing that we try to teach people, let's just say you find water in a stream or a river and you're like, well, I'm really thirsty and I have no other choice but to drink this water. All right. Um, we recommend that you put about eight drops of Clorox into your gallon of water and it should um, kill the bacteria and stuff like that. That's bacteria. But chemicals, you know, it's one of those things like you're just trying to survive. So that's what we try to teach people. Am I going to do it? Probably not. But I do try to um, keep water and things like that in my office, in my house so that I can have plenty of water to drink. All right. Um, if you're going to do any disaster plan, it's important that you involve your family members, tell them exactly where they're going to meet. When I work on the emergency action plan for the county, I actually tell people exactly where we're going to meet. I don't just tell them, hey, there's a fire. I want everybody to just run wherever they want to run. I actually have a place that everybody goes to and they and we kind of stop and we're like, OK, this is where we're going to go and check in. Um, we have like um, like when you have an evacuation plan, work on it with your family. Um, some of the questions is like, how are, are your family gonna escape? Like if you're at the very top floor, things like that, it's important that you ask these questions, you know? Um, what route should you go? Will you use it, evacuate your neighborhood? Um, do you have a transportation for where you're going? And did you practice your plan? So make sure that with any plan, you need to practice it. It's not something that you're just gonna add it automatically. No. Um, you need to practice it with your family so that you guys are singing on the same sheet of music whenever something bad happens, okay? So consider children. Children are important, you know, um, especially ones with disabilities. Um, older generation where they take medication, things like that, you know, consider their medication. Uh, you want to practice your drills and, and go to those locations. Um, talked about that already. Let's see. Uh oh. oh. We're not talking about that. All right. Um, so a little bit about the summary of preparedness is basically identify the roles and responsibility of community preparedness, kind of like uh, what we've been talking about. Um, describe the types of hazards, which we did already. Discover ways to prepare for disasters and describe functions of preparedness. So that's a little bit about what we talked about. So now we're gonna go straight into fire utilities. This is, uh, I think this is gonna be a little bit more fun. I'll really get into, go into the, um, the fire aspect of it, teach you guys a little bit about fire. All right, so we're gonna find ways to identify, reduce potential fires and, and uh, utility risk, explain basic safety precautions, um, identify hazardous materials and extinguish small fires using a fire extinguisher. So you'll actually learn a little bit about fire extinguishers as well. All right, so this is this is actually called the fire triangle or the fire tetrahedron. Um, these are the three elements that you'll need to have a uh, fire. Without these three elements, a fire does not exist. So you have to have heat, fuel, and oxygen, okay? So let's just think of like saying you're cooking something in the oven and that item catches on fire in the oven. The best thing you need to do is to shut the oven. Don't try to bring that item out uh, because now you're introducing oxygen or um, things like that. So that's the, the fuel, oxygen, and heat. So let's think about, all right, so you already know what oxygen is, heat, fuels like gasoline, the food item or what it is, whatever it is. And that is the fire triangle. All right. So the different classes of fires on a fire extinguisher, if you grab fire extinguisher, um, these are the types of fire extinguishers you will probably have. A is for ordinary combustibles. B is flammable and combustible liquids. 
C is energized electrical equipment. D is for combustible metals. So let's stop right there. Combustible metals, well, what would be that type of item? Well, think of your cell phone, like lithium, for example, magnesium, things that are in batteries are catching fire. So it's your cell phones, uh, your watches and things like that. Anything that has those metals in it can catch on fire. And then the last thing is K is for cooking oil. So just remember that A, B, C, D, and K, okay? And you can look on the fire extinguishers and you'll actually get to see what I'm talking about. All right. So if you have a lot of, uh, we call it electrical octopus, basically people try to put a lot of wires, especially behind uh, TVs and things like that, and they mix it all up and and, it, and it's just some, a bunch of wires. Well, a lot of times if you touch those wires, you can see, you can feel the heat on them. So you want to avoid any electrical octopuses. Uh, don't run cords under carpet. Um, check for and replace any broken or frayed wires and uh, maintain your appliances because that it, by just doing that, you could avoid a lot of fires in your house. All right. Um, it's important that you know where the shutoff valves are in your house um, so that if something bad happens, you're not a main shutoff. There's a fuse box in every house, in every home that you can actually switch off and it'll turn off. Um, it's important now to turn off your appliances, circuit breakers, fuses, um, any utility shutoffs and no procedures for turning off uh, power and turning it back on. So here's some examples of some fuse boxes uh, you may see in your house. If you don't know what a fuse box is, this is just a, it's a way for you to look. Um, the thing about natural gas hazard awareness is that, you know, a lot of the gases are odorless, meaning you can't smell it, and tasteless, meaning you can't taste it. So if it's leaking in your house, you may not even know. So the best thing to do is actually place a uh, natural gas detector, uh, carbon monoxide detector, um, things like that in your house, a smoke detector. Sometimes it's a combination. In my house, I have a uh, Nest combination one. It's actually a smart alarm uh, if it smells uh, anything or it knows anything, it'll send me a text, it'll ring, it'll call me, all that. And uh, it's a part of my uh, smart home that I have in my house. Um, and the battery life lasts for like three years. So a lot of times if you're going to the newer sub newer um, alarm systems, have lithium batteries in it and it'll last a lot longer. Um, but you want to test the batteries every six months and replace it if you need to. So basically around this time, I'm going to check my batteries one good time. And as long as it's good, I'm, I'm good for the year. But around like this time, people change out batteries just so that they can have a, a fresh um, a smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector and things like that. A lot of these gases, like I said, are odorless and colorless and tasteless. And what happens is you could be sleeping in your bed and get carbon monoxide poisoning because you have your heaters on and it and it's putting carbon monoxide in your house. So um, things like that. So here's a gas shut off. If you don't know where it's at in your, um, it connects to your house. Every house has one of these. If you have gas, if you have electricity, obviously you're gonna go to the other fuse box, but if you have gas in your house, this is how you turn it off. Uh, make sure you turn it off. The tool doesn't have can't spark because you don't want it to spark if it's leaking, right? So um, that's what it looks like. So if you have any questions, you know you could always email me, and I'll make sure that I show you where it's at in your house. All right. A lot of times people have uh, we we use the word lies in our house or limit isolation, eliminate and separate uh, chemicals in your house. Um, people call these hazmat. Clorox and Lysol and, and toilet cleaner and things like that should not be mixed because if you mix it, it could cause a lot of issues, a lot of breathing issues because it gives off fumes and things like that. So it could be very difficult. So you want to like separate these and make sure you do not mix them. They, it does not, uh, when you mix them, it doesn't make it clean better or anything. It's just, it's poisonous for you. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the fire extinguishers. Um, the different types of fire extinguishers. Again, uh, this is going to be for water. Um, it's just, you'll see this on our fire trucks. Um, and it it's good for dry chemicals. Um, there Actually, there's water, dry chemicals. There's carbon dioxide ones, which is um, 
people actually, you can actually, uh, if you're in a room and you use the carbon monoxide, you can actually uh, put yourself to sleep because you know, you're, it's a, you're breathing out carbon monoxide, so you can't breathe in. But if you're in a room trying to put out a fire, you can actually, uh, actually kill yourself if you uh, deprive yourself of oxygen. And then there's obviously some specialized fire extinguishers. The one that you're probably going to see the most is going to be the dry chemical one. And that's what we're going to go talk about next. All right. With fire extinguishers, there's an acronym that we like to teach people. It's called PASS. Um, is basically pull. When you grab a fire extinguisher, you want to pull the pin, you want to aim it, you want to squeeze it, and you want to sweep so that when you, you put it out. So that's the acronym that we actually teach everybody in, in, um, when it comes to fire. All right, when you're using the fire extinguisher, you don't, you want to make sure you don't get too close to it. Uh, don't try to fight the fire alone. Obviously, if it's one of those things that's gotten really big, you don't want to um, try to do it by yourself. Um, if it's gotten way too big for you and you use the fire extinguisher, it's not putting it out, go ahead and leave uh, and don't go into there because most most of the time people aren't burning up when they're putting a fire, you know, putting fire out. They're not burning up. And they're dying. It's actually the smoke inhalation that's happening. Um, Um, I'm not going to teach you guys about the NFPA 704 diamond. Um, just know that this this diamond is um, you'll see this in a lot of buildings and locations that um, have hazardous materials. Um, these are the different placards that you'll see um, on the roads. If one of these is on a truck or anything, you know that they're carrying hazardous materials. So if it's an accident and you see one of these placards, you probably don't want to be in the middle of it because uh, you will get hazmat on you. And that's not good. All right. Um, that's a little bit about the the fire extinguishers and the fire safety utilities. Um, I usually within this class, I like to give people some hands on. I'm not just lecturing, I don't, you know, death by PowerPoints like I'm against that. But usually if, if this is something you want to learn even more, we'll actually come out to your location and we'll teach you about um, creating a fire drill and having a, uh, you know, learning about the different types of fire extinguishers and actually uh, putting out a fire and things like that. And that's pretty much uh, my preparedness class, Ms. Kimberly. Thank you. Just a quick question with regards to the past section. You mentioned sweep. Um, can you, because some people might figure uh, when you're sweeping with your fire extinguisher, they might want to go directly at the fire. Are you, could you tell us a little more? Should it be directly at the fire, at the base of the fire? Where, where are we sweeping at? Yes. So uh, on a fire extinguisher, whenever you, you're going to pull it first, you're going to aim it, and then you're going to squeeze the, uh, the lever to allow uh, the powder to come out. When you're sweeping, you just want to sweep at the bottom of the fire, at the base of the fire, uh, go back and forth until the fire goes out. Um, you obviously don't want to spread directly on the fire. It's going to be at the base of the fire. Okay. And one other thing too, um, as we talk about um, having a plan, uh, what kind of suggestions would you give to um, individuals who have children? Because we know that sometimes uh, uh, certain disasters may occur when we are at work in school. And so mm -hmm. what type of um, advice would you give to, to children with parents? I mean, I'm sorry, to parents whose children are in school at the time of a disaster? Well, you know, the, the school usually, uh, they have fire drills monthly. Um, they, you know, my suggestion is if you're going to be participating in the fire drill, make sure that you do it at 100%. Um, when we go out and we do a fire drill for people, we actually allow the alarm company to actually call 911, dispatch one of our fire trucks out there. We'll cancel it, but we want to make sure even our 911 center knows exactly that the alarm company is working. So air, we want to make sure everything's working. We want to want to see everybody leaving the building and coming, you know, who's all leaving the building, who's all deciding to sit, who we when we practice, we practice 100%. It's never, you know, we're not going to uh, allow certain people to leave. We want to shut it down and do everything we need to do. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. And if I can share my screen quickly. 
Okay. I... All right. Okay, and so I wanted to just share a little information with the audience. Um, just remember, we are members of the Clayton County Library System that's um, collaborating with uh, uh, Captain Wen to present this program. Um, keep in mind that the library has many, many resources, and these are just a few of the books that can be checked out um, from any of our Clayton County Library, or you can visit the Pines and put your books on hold or visit claytonpl.org or even call the library at 773-473-3850 and place your books at hold, on hold. But keep in mind, again, the library is there for you for um, whatever additional information that you may want with regards to the topic that we're sharing today. I wanna thank uh, uh, Captain Wen for his time and for this presentation. Thank you, Captain Wen. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay, you do the same.